Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Ellen, are we ready today? Yeah. All right. Okay, kids, fifth, fifth grade and younger, you guys get to go back into the fellowship hall and start your Christmas program practicing. Isn't that awesome? Are you guys excited for Christmas? Who else is excited for Christmas? Any Christmas lights go up yet? Because I'm going to come tear them down if you've got them up already. We can practice kids programming, but you can't put lights on your house until after Thanksgiving. That's the rule. Okay. You can sing, I sing Christmas songs all year round, though, so just so you know. But lights are very different. Okay? I just, mm. Am I the only one in this? No amens? You guys have Halloween lights up, right? Oh, oh, oh boy, okay. My mom, when we, when we grew up, it was the day after Thanksgiving, so back when, I'm, this is how old I am, back in that day, they didn't really have a lot of Black Friday Christmas shopping, um, either the day after Thanksgiving, so the day after Thanksgiving for us was decorating the house for Christmas, the day after Thanksgiving, and now my mom, every year, it's like earlier and earlier and earlier and I think at some point in time, she's going to want to put a Christmas tree up around July 4th. I don't know. But it's literally every year, it's a week earlier, a week earlier. This year, she finally, uh, she finally gave Rachel um, all of my ornaments. Does anyone else do that? Like each kid has their own set of ornaments or whatever. Um, yeah, my mom finally gave them to Rachel because I've, for like 10, 10 or 12 years or something, I've refused to put them up. And my parents, because I don't live there anymore, so I shouldn't be putting them up. Okay. Anyways, I have a whole list of things about Christmas that needs to be done a certain way, and my mom and I don't always agree, so that's all right. And just in case you missed it, talk to somebody in, in the Fellowship Hall Sunday School classroom, because we had a discussion about Santa Claus this morning that you would not believe in Sunday School class. Started out with Samson, ended up with Santa Claus, okay? Don't, don't ask, yeah, blame Dorothy, but that's all right. It was a good, it was a good class, good discussion. Um... So we're going to continue on with, I didn't bring my stand down, that's all right. We didn't, we're going to continue on with uh, Go Team Jesus, uh, talking about the words of Jesus Christ and what He uh, is wanting to get us today to hear about the way that He, um, what He told His disciples back when He was alive and around um, and doing all that kind of stuff. And He had this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, right, that we're, we're kind of going through that Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 again today, starting with verse 17 when I get to read, but... I want you guys to, have anybody ever, ever uh, have an annoying older sibling, and I was that annoying older sibling, that, that when your mom said, uh, don't touch your sister, or don't touch your brother, you would put your finger, right, like, like here, like right here, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, and then you would hit, the sibling would hit you, you know, and then you'd go get to tell your mom that they hit you, you know, but, but see, here's the deal, I didn't break any rules. Right? I'm not breaking any rules. I'm not. I'm not touching her. I'm not. I'm not touching her at all. Right? I can. I can. You know. Right? I'm not touching her. She's fine. No, if she touched me, she broke the rules. Right? Who's the Who's the annoyer there? It was. It was me. Right? Or have you ever? Uh, uh, your parent like. For us, I'm going to go back to Christmas because we our discussion back there made me think of this today. I when growing up, we had a split level house. So the, the, the family room and the kitchen were on the, uh, the main floor. And then we had a, a small staircase down to the basement, or not the basement, but the lower level, which was my bedroom, a bathroom, and uh, the living room. And then another staircase that went upstairs to the three bedrooms upstairs where my brother and my sister and my parents were. So the rule on Christmas morning was that you could not come out of your room until a certain time when mom and dad got everything set up. They took all their pictures, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then at some point they would say, okay, you can come out of your room, but don't come on the stairs, right? Because as soon as you got on the stairs, it was the, the, the walls were built in such a way where you could see, you know, around. So um, don't get on the stairs, right? So then I would try to, the stairs right here, I would put my feet right up against that bottom step. I wasn't on the stairs, right? And as I got older and older and older, and I, I was a tall guy, I could, I could lean forward. And start to see, and I start calling out what everybody got from, from Santa Claus, right? I start calling it out, and oh my goodness, did I get in trouble. Uh, um, but see, at that point, it was good because I was bigger than my dad at that point, so he couldn't really do anything. Um, but I wasn't breaking any rules. I didn't, I didn't break the rules. I tried so hard not to break the rules. We do that all the time in this life. 
We have a standard that we need to follow. These rules that we need to follow. And we come as close as we can to doing exactly what's on that list of rules without crossing the line, but we're trying to figure out a way to do it in which we can still get what we want, right? We're up against it, but we're leaning over the line just a little bit, right? I'm, my feet are right here. I'm not. So like in football or basketball, uh, you stand on the sideline or your foot's right next to the sideline. You can lean out over that sideline and not be out of bounds, right? It's where your feet are at, right? So if we kind of have the same, same idea here, we're coming, we're buttoning up right against this, this law, this rule, whatever it is, and we start to lean over it to get what we want, just a little bit sometimes. And that lean, and sometimes we start leaning so far, you fall, and you take that step over the line because you try to get so close to this line without breaking the rule, you start playing with fire, right? Right? Draw a line in the sand, don't cross that line. I always heard, my, my, my dad always told me, if you want to draw a line in the sand, and he, he was talking about uh, my relationships uh, with my girlfriends at the time, he would draw a, he said, if you want to draw a line in the sand, that's fine. Make sure you go draw another line in the sand that's about 10 feet back. Uh, that, so you don't get anywhere near that actual line, right? Um, and we can apply that to our lives in everything. When I was not touching you, and you touched me, you broke the rule. I didn't break the rule. But where was my heart? My heart was in getting what I wanted, which was to annoy her, right? That was what was in my heart. So even though I didn't break the rule, I broke the rule, right? And that's what we're going to get into today in Matthew chapter 5. And it's, it's, we're going to start with verse 17, and I'm going to read through verse 37. So just bear with me as I read, and I'm sorry I didn't get it up on the screen today. Uh, there should be Bibles in your pews if you don't have one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and these are all verses that we've probably heard of before. Starts out, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. This is Jesus talking. Uh, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to stop there for a second. And this is where the main focus of today's message comes from. We're going to touch on the things afterwards, but this is where the main thing is. I want to, verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness, and we've talked a lot on Wednesday nights about righteousness, but basically the idea of right living. We want to live rightly, follow the will of God. He makes us righteous because of our faith, but then we want to live righteously with our life. We want to make choices that, that, that look like righteousness. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Wait a minute. Jesus has spent his entire ministry so far, and he does it afterwards, knocking the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, saying, you guys, he calls them a brood of vipers at one point. He says they are awful people. They turned his, his father's house into a money pit, right? He turned over the tables and the money changers and all that kind of stuff, yells at them all the time, calls them evil, and he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of them, then you will, not, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So there is something to be said about following the rules. Okay? There's absolute, in our world today, we don't like, we don't like rules, okay? Uh, and, I, and I want to be careful here because we can go off on a lot of different tangents, um, but following the rules today, a lot of times comes down to, does it line up with what I want? Does it line up with what I think I want? So these rules that somebody else has established, what if I don't like those rules? Well... I don't, I, I don't follow them, right? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do it uh, unless I'm afraid of the consequences. And a lot of times in our world today, we are becoming less and less afraid of those consequences. We have got to make sure that we are following the rules of God, even if we don't like them, okay? And so he's, Jesus is really good. He's, he's probably the best speaker ever. He establishes this, right? He says, 
follow these rules. Unless you want to, unless you don't want to go to heaven, don't worry about following the rules then. But if you want to make it, if you want to make it to heaven, be righteous, right living. And then he goes on and mentions some rules, right? And we're going to get to that here in just a little bit. The idea of Jesus fulfilling the law. He says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. A lot of people thought that when Jesus came and he starts his ministry here on earth, that it was going to take the law out, that, that Mo, the Moses law, the Mosaic law that came when Moses came down from the mountain, the Ten Commandments, and then expanded there from ten rules, right? The Ten Commandments. And does anyone know the number of Jewish laws? 612. That's what the Pharisees and teachers of the law did to the Ten Commandments. They took it from 10 and made it 612. They made rules that established how to follow those rules, right? They, they made it so impossible to break those Ten Commandments by setting other rules in place that, again, and, and some of it's good, and Jesus is saying here, unless you're as righteous as those people, you're not going to make it. So here, the Ten Commandments is the line in the sand. And the fair teachers, teachers of the law and Pharisees backed up about 10 feet and put a 600, 600 more laws, uh, lines in the sand. So that, if, you, if you make sure you don't break these, you're definitely not going to break the Ten Commandments. Okay? Does that make sense there, what the, Jew, the, the Israelites did uh, up through that time? And then the teachers and the Pharisees of the law, teachers of the law and Pharisees uh, came through, and they really, really worked hard at making sure you followed these laws, followed these new rules. Jesus says, I have not come to abolish those, to do away with those. I have come to be the fulfillment of them. All of the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament and and, and you don't get a picture of Jesus as you read it, or or what I would encourage you to do is when you read the Old Testament, think about Jesus. How does Jesus fit into this Old Testament? Because the entire Old Testament is leading up to the birth of Jesus. To establish God's plan of redeeming all of the world through His Son, Jesus Christ. So as you read that Old Testament, think about Jesus. Now some of it's very easy. Isaiah and Daniel, there's a lot of prophecies about what, uh, about what the, the Messiah is going to look like, what, what to expect when all that kind of thing happens. But as we're talking about in our Sunday school classes back in the, in the, in, in the Fellowship Hall, how does the Old Testament apply to us today? How does the Old Testament fit in with what we're trying to do today? And that is absolutely a role of Jesus, where He gives us this idea of how we can live righteously. He has not come to abolish them, to do away with the laws, but to fulfill them. Now, rules deal with actions, right? I didn't touch Chloe. I never touched her once. She touched me. She broke the rule. I didn't touch her. But yet, my heart, my heart was wrong. So you can, you can live correctly and not live righteously. Okay? You can live correctly by the world's standards and not live righteously. Okay? So what does that mean? If I'm not worried about the rules, does that mean I can just come up and hit her anytime I want or touch her anytime I want or do whatever? No. That still doesn't mean you have a license to sin or license to do wrong. What it means is you can't expect to follow the rules to the letter of the law and still make it to heaven. You have to have a heart that lines up with your actions. A heart that lines up with your actions. Your heart that's following Jesus Christ leads you to act accordingly and not the other way around. Too many times we try to act correctly and think that that saves our heart. And it doesn't. Absolutely does not. Your heart has to come first. That's why Paul says we don't judge those outside the church. Those inside the church who have made a claim to follow Jesus Christ, who have made a, uh, a statement of faith that says, I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. We have the, the right and we have the actual obligation to be able to gently call a brother to repentance, brother or sister to repentance. Those outside the church, we're not worrying about their actions. We're worrying about their heart. Amen? Too many times we get caught up in the actions of the world that does not know Jesus Christ. We've got to focus on having their hearts come to know who Jesus is and then let the Holy Spirit lead them to act righteously. And then we live by example. They have something to follow. That's how that relationship should work. We, we can't go around telling people, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, 
when they know nothing about Jesus Christ and what He can do to change their hearts. Because your actions won't change unless your heart changes. Amen? Anyone ever been there before? Try to change your actions, but your heart's not really in it? It's impossible. It's impossible. And we're going to get into some of these things that Jesus mentioned specifically, but I know there's areas in your own lives that you can deal with. And all you, my own, my, my gambling issues, I, I wanted to change them. I wanted to say I'm done. But until God changed my heart about the fact that it was wrong, I could try to justify it the whole time. I've paid my tithe. I'm current on my bills. Why can't I use this money to just do what I want? And God changed me, changed my heart, and that changed my actions. Okay? And every single one of us has an area in our lives where that is the case or could be the case. And that's why I appreciate what Beth said about the fact that we need to check our hearts, check your spirit, check where you're at between you and God. And I promise you, if you're really, truly seeking out His will, He is going to give you areas of your life that He wants to bring you closer to Him in those areas. But you've got to be honest with yourself. All right, moving on. Murder. Easy one, right? It's like when we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit murder. Duh, right? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, verse 21, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But, anytime Jesus throws, throws a but in there, pay attention. But I tell you, I can't keep my pages shut, but I tell you that anyone who is angry, uh-oh, angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And I did a word study, original language, that subject to judgment in verse 21, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, is the same subject to judgment as, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with the brother or subject, sister will be subject to judgment. Same penalty. Same penalty. A lot of people have argued that it's a lesser penalty. Anyone ever heard of purgatory? Uh, that's a big thing that's kind of going around now again. Or this idea of, of everyone's going to make it to heaven, but after you die, you're going to spend a time away from God uh, that, that lines up with how bad you were on earth, and you'll spend this time away from God, and then when you've paid your penance, you'll go up. It's not true. Hear anybody that says that, don't laugh at them. That's not going to work. Don't argue with them. Just love them. Okay, anyways. Verse uh, 22, but I tell you, anyone who's angry will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Anyone ever called anybody a name? Been here before? Okay. This is supposed to, this is supposed to cut all of us close to the heart, right? Uh, called anybody a name? Okay. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus basically at this point here in his message is again saying that none of us are free from the guilt of sin in this world. Okay? Everyone's been angry. Not even going to ask you to raise your hands because probably I'll have some people lying and not raise their hand. And I don't want you to do that to yourselves here in church. Okay? Everybody in here has been angry at some time or another. Everybody in here has called somebody a name. You fool. Idiot. Worse than that. And Jesus is saying that you are just as guilty for those things as if you murdered somebody. You have the same penalty on your soul as if you had murdered somebody. And then he does a great thing and gives us, because he knows that people are going to be angry at each other. He knows that people are going to have issues between each other. He gives them the proper way to handle it, which is awesome, to be reconciled to each other. Great, great thing. But the law says, do not murder. Anybody ever, anybody wanted to murder somebody? Anybody ever wanted to, uh, 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 wished somebody were no longer breathing the same air as, as you? Um, that's, 
coming up to the line, peeking over it just a little bit. I wish, oh, if this could happen, if they would fall out of the window three stories up, get in a car accident. And here's what I'm here to tell you. The more you think about something like that, the more you, whatever what it is that you're bumping up against that line, the more you lean your head on this side, the, the more easy it is, it is to live into that reality, to make that a reality and make that step across the line. Jesus is telling us that no matter where you're at with this issue of, of, of murder, most of us, I don't, I don't think anyone here has ever murdered anybody, but we are all guilty of the same crime. And we need to be restored. Okay? It's not the law. That's the problem. It's our hearts. That's the problem. It's anger in our hearts. That's the problem. It's the, uh, the, 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 the using of words and language that really shows what's in your heart. You call someone a name, you're not filled with love for that person. You're filled with anger or jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, right? That same chapter of Galatians that gives the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Same chapter that just a few verses before talks about all the things that are the opposite of those fruit of the Spirit. Selfish ambition, fits of rage, jealousy, discord, hatred, all those things. And we have those in our hearts, we don't have love. Okay? All right, moving on. Adultery. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Again, line, don't do this. There are things that we can do that, that aren't breaking that rule, but our heart is not in following that rule. That heart is in trying to live to a letter of the law and still get what we want out of it. Okay? And he uses adultery to exemplify that again. Okay? And then the thing to do, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. If you have a problem with uh, speaking angry words, should you cut off your tongue? Uh, if you have problems, you know, not touching but not touching people, should you cut off your finger? Uh, we've got to have a way to avoid this line. And again, the more we come closer to it, the more we want to look around it. And the more we want to try to figure out a way to not break the rule necessarily, but get what we want. And Jesus is telling us it's not about what you want. It's about living righteously and with a heart that gives forth good actions. So if you want to live righteously and you've got a problem and something is causing you to continue to sin, get rid of it. Anybody ever done that? My dad, when he became a Christian, uh, he, loved, <laughs> he, he loved the band Kiss. Okay? Anybody a Kiss fan? Anybody? Really? All right. But he got rid of his Kiss collection. Okay, he had the he had like the dolls, and I make fun of him about all this all the time. He had dolls with the, the tongue hanging out. He had masks. He had all the records, the forty fives or thirty three. See, I'm not that old. I don't know which one he had, uh, but he had those. He bur- he literally had a bonfire in his backyard and burned all those things because he was so convicted that God wanted him to get rid of it. And it's not because those things by themselves are inherently a sin. It's because those things caused him to think about things that were a sin. They caused him to bump up to the line and these things are causing him to desire what's on the other side of the line and so he got rid of them. Right? Anybody ever done that? Like, I would encourage you very much. If there's something that you continually struggle with, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Consult the doctor before you cut your hand off. That's all I'm going to say. Divorce. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife, this is verse 31, must give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, 
There are reasons for divorce. Absolutely 100%. Biblical reasons for divorce. But don't use it as a way to follow a rule that says, oh, I'm allowed to do this because there are consequences to that. Okay? Again, it's a heart issue. Where is your heart at when it comes to dealing with this person that God has put you together with? Okay? Oaths. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. I promise. I promise, honey. I'm going to take out the trash. I promise. I'll go to the grocery store after work. I promise. I'm going to mow the yard. I promise. Anybody ever use that word? We do that because the word promise is inherently something that we learned a long time ago as kids. The word promise has special value. And Jesus tells us not to use it. Anybody ever broken a promise? Okay, everyone's a liar. (laughs) We've all broken promises. Absolutely 100%. And Jesus knew that that would happen. Don't do it! Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Don't promise. Okay? Don't swear by anything. He says, don't swear by even your own head. Don't say, I promise that I'm going to do this, and you can do whatever you want to me. You have no power. You have no authority to do anything. God gives power and authority. It is His alone to give. And when we make a promise, and we don't fulfill that promise, man, you're playing with fire that you don't want to play with. God, tell, Jesus is telling us it's a hard issue. When you say something, do you mean it? Or do you just flippantly use words to get what you want? Right? There are some, there are some people in this world and we call them narcissists sometimes. We call them uh, masochists. We call them um, <laughs> all kinds of deep psychological terms and they can talk their way out of any situation, right? There are people in this world like that that have the, have the ability in their minds to use the words that we all speak, but they use them in a way to get exactly what they want. And they don't fulfill their promises. We call them politicians also. Okay. Amen. Amen. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Let your heart dictate your actions. And that includes your words. That includes what you put on Facebook. That includes what you joke around about with your friends. That includes how you raise your kids and what they see you doing in this world. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Let your heart that is following Jesus guide your actions. And don't peek around the law. Follow the law, but follow it because your heart's right. And if you're struggling with something today, that you are not following the law for some reason, that you're, you, tend to, you tend to be someone who peeks around that corner a lot. You butt up against the stairs and you're trying to see up there. You're coming as close to breaking that law as possible, but you don't, and you're trying to get what you want out of it. If that describes you today... Come talk to Jesus. I'm just going to open the altar up for just a few moments. It's just going to be quiet. I'll close in prayer. Now here's the deal. When we do things like this, sometimes it's scary to come up front. Sometimes it's scary to come kneel at the altar and say, I've I've done something. But here's what I promise you. Every person in here has done that. Every person who claims to follow Jesus Christ has done that, and not a single one of them regrets it. And you will be the same way. If there is something that you're struggling with today, 
where you're peeking around that corner, where you're trying to get what you want out of life, circumvent the rules, break the rules right out, and you don't care because they're not your rules to follow. Jesus is saying there's a way to go. There's forgiveness and mercy and grace and repentance, and it's a beautiful plan. And God wants that for every single one of us. So I'll ask you to stand. Ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want you to just check your hearts. As Beth asked us to do earlier, check your heart for what God is speaking to you about. Where are you falling short and living righteously? And let God draw you close to Him. I'm going to be silent for just a few moments, then I'll close in prayer. But these altars are open, and Jesus is calling you to Him today. Heavenly Father, as we stand here today, I know that there are others who are being spoken to you by you right now. Lord God, and I pray that they would respond to you at home, on the drive home, when they come back tonight, Lord God. I pray so hard for each person in this room to give their lives to you, to surrender to you, Lord God. And it doesn't matter what age. We've got teenagers in here, Lord God. We've got senior adults in here, Lord, who have, who have lived lives of following you. And you tell us that we will be worked on for all of our lives. So, Lord God, let us, even those of us who have known you for a while, feel open about confessing to you what you have asked us to confess. Lord God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for who you are and the fact that you sent your son to give us these words, that it is more than just following the law. It is the fulfilling of the law by living Jesus out through our lives because he is in our hearts. And that drives us to live righteously. Lord God, I love you. I thank you. And then we pray. Amen. Amen. If anyone would like to come up and pray uh, now, that would be great. You are dismissed otherwise.